I'm going to talk about wave nets. Um, so probably if you've been here before, you, you know something about me. Um, I moved from New York City. I'm originally English. I moved from New York City in September 2013. 2014 was kind of sabbatical year um, when I just focused on machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing, did some robots and drones. Um, but since 2015, I've been in kind of serious mode, and I'm doing natural language processing, deep learning. I've managed to write a few papers along the way. Recently, we were at NIPS, or I, Sam and I went to NIPS, which was fantastic. Um, and we've also been teaching a developer course. So um, things are beginning to turn, turn into something now. Okay. So the outline of this, I'm going to talk a little bit about WaveNet version 1 and then what it's made out of. Um, and then some enhancements. So there's, firstly, there was fast WaveNet, which is a, an like a necessary optimization. Um, but then we went to parallel WaveNet, which is a whole new ball game. And that is what is shown on people's Google's home in America and in Japan. But um, why is it excitement? And, and how did that work? <coughs> so WaveNet version 1. Deep, it came from Google DeepMind. So Google acquired DeepMind a while ago. Um, this is one kind of concrete product which they came out of it. <coughs> um, and in this, the Splash blog post they had, they announced the, the paper. And also, it has some nice clickable audio examples. So uh, this presentation, I'll put links up on, you know, on, in the meetup. You can click on these, get to the web page. Um, the key thing here, though, the, the reason it was exciting is that if this is human speech with this kind of mean opinion score, and these, are the, these two are the previous ways of doing it. So suddenly, um, WaveNet is a whole lot closer to being human-like. Um, so this was you know, dramatically better. And so this was the blog post which came out. Um, and they explained how, basically, you know, this low res, you know, they're actually predicting audio samples. So this is what they're doing. That's the clever thing. And they have little diagrams, which is very nice. Here's the, here's the thing. And basically, um, let me just play some audio. Hopefully, this is going to come out of my speakers. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. Can anyone hear that? Aspects of the Sublime in English Poetry and Painting, 1770-1850. Is it coming out at all? <laughs> How about we have two? Aspects of the Sublime in English Poetry and Painting, 1770-1850. Try again. Aspects of the Sublime in English Poetry and Painting, 1770 to 1850. Okay, so this, this, the, the way in which this first one is done is they have a, a, like a speech synthesizer, which is something where they're moving the parameters around on this very quickly. So it's trying to make a synthesizer output speech. And so what, what happens here is it tends to feel a bit sing-songy. Uh, it's a bit weird, a bit kind of lumpy in a way. Aspects of the Sublime in English Poetry and Painting, 1770 to 1850. Now, the next method, is, which is commonly used, and, and say Apple will use, is concatenative. So what they do for this is they pick that they know what, sil what phonemes you're going to be producing, and they're going to pick out of a, a large corpus what is the closest match to that phoneme and just output the wave signal and then blend them all together. So basically this is taking from a corpus of speech like the closest thing what you're trying to say and just hitting the speaker with it. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. So this used to be kind of the winner in the quality war just because you know, each individual segment of it was pretty high quality. But the problem is if you, if you listen to it carefully, now, I, now I'll tell you what, what's, now, now you tell me what to listen for, you'll hear that it's going from little piece to up and down like the, the song is all wrong because it's taken from the song from a completely different corpus and so it jumps around all over the place. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, English 1770 poetry. to 1850. So it's got, it's got the individual sounds right but it's got the song of English wrong. Whereas this thing will get the song of English correct, but the sounds will be a bit off. Aspects of the 
of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. Okay, so along comes Wavenet. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. Can people hear that that's markedly better? Okay, well, this is, it's not me, this is the Google Play. So this is suddenly, suddenly DeepMind comes along and they've done something really pretty good. So uh, if we look at Mandarin Chinese, which is I know nothing about, but... But you might be able to hear this sounds more like a, like a Casio version of someone, right? Whereas, so this is very kind of deliberate. WaveNet. So I don't, I, I'm not one to say, but maybe that's quite good. I don't know. So, um, the other thing which they can do is they can play a game with um, just trying to say, uh, let the network loose and just try and say stuff without being driven by text. I just ate them. There's a lot of work that can to be turned into the name because I'm Jeff over it. It's over to it because they're not are they? That here would happen. So this is kind of a model of, of human speech, which is, you know, that clearly... Yeah, they show this to the good as well. It's kind of disturbing. So basically, WaveNet has understood both how to form the individual sounds, but also join them together in a, in a language-like way. Um, and they can also play games with... This one's really sad. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with... The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathers. So they can do multiple speakers just by changing some parameters for their network. They can also play some games with music, which we have no time for. So let's just So th this is why this is kind of exciting, is that this is markedly different from what would come before. Um, and so I'll just explain what the key elements of this were um, one by one. So one of the important things is that they're producing audio samples just as the output of a neural network, which is kind of remarkable. In, in the past, people have been emitting words or maybe some like changing pictures a bit. But here they're predicting individual samples at 16 kilohertz, which is it's kind of crazy. And they're also doing it you know, in, at 8-bit resolution. So and then I'll give you more idea about how that's going. But one of the surprising things is that a normal recurrent neural network, which is how you would normally think of producing a time series or, or analyzing a time series, you're kind of talking about 50 steps is kind of where it maxes out. But these word features are thousands of steps in, in space, in, so in time for these things. So how are they analyzing this? And so this is kind of one of the remarkable things. Now one. One of the things they did was you can't use recurrent neural networks or standard recurrent neural networks, so let's use convolutional neural networks. And these are familiar from the vision, like computer vision people. But one of the problems with that is if I have an, a network which is four layers deep, basically I only go four layers back in time, or four time steps back in time. In order to go a thousand time steps back in time, I have to have a thousand layers. So this, this is a problem. So it kind of has a linear footprint. So what the, one innovation here is they have these dilated CNNs. And you'll see that at the bottom we have just a, a one-stepper. But the next one up has a skip of two. And the next one up above that will have a skip of four, and then a skip of eight. By having this, if you, if you look, the, basically you can join them on. And now you've got kind of like an exponential length of time you could be referencing. I mean, clearly... Uh, you're not referencing this piece, you're only referencing bits of the past. But at least you have some idea of going much further back. So then if you have a 10 layer deep thing, you can go back a thousand steps. Okay. Another thing which they do is, well, so with, with CNNs, you've got the pros and cons. I mean, the advantage of this is you can get this very long look back. Um, and you can train it faster. Basically, all you need to do is you have your, here's my time steps for my long piece of speech as input, what I want it to predict is the next sample at every stage. But I, can kn I know what that is just by using the same sequence shifted back by one. So that will allow me to align input to output for every single time step 
in just one training example across thousands and thousands of... Because um, there's come kind of a time invariance going on in that it doesn't matter what second you speak a particular word, it's all going to be the same. Um, but within that second, the, the, you need to capture that whole variance. On the other hand, the disadvantage is how do you know what the next sample is? I've now got to carry, suppose I predicted a sample at time zero to time one, I now need to carry that time one sample back to the bottom of my CNN and evaluate this massive thing thousands upon thousands of times in order to get a sequence of speech. Whereas with an RNN, I could just go one sample to the next sample to the next sample to the next sample to the next sample. Another thing which they do is at each of these dots, in, which has got this kind of gathering mechanism, is not just a simple multiply and add. They actually have this, they, they divide it into two pieces, and they do a tan on one side and a sigmoid on the other, multiply them together, then do a one-by-one one convolution, and then add them to what you first thought of, and this is one of those dots. So this, this kind of extra complexity, this kind of gated unit, also adds something. It clearly adds something, otherwise they wouldn't have put it in, because I don't think they want to just burn money, though the outcome of this is they do burn money. So, The other thing which they do is they have these side chains. So across all of the, each of these individual circles also have, feeds into this thing which is a chain of essentially convolutional, one-dimensional, con one-by-one convolutional layers so, in order to get to a softmax, which is the output. So the output is fed kind of sideways. You've got this vertical breakdown of, of time and sideways is kind of the sum of all possible times for each sample. But the other thing is they're not producing a single number at each, each time step. They produce a whole distribution of what, what it thinks the next sample should be. So it, instead of having a neural network which produces, is trying to track the, the exact number, which is like a, a, you could do a regression for it. You know, here's, here is the perfect value to come out with. It's actually producing like a scatter diagram of guess where the number should be. And so clearly they find that this is the better way to do it. Um, but it does seem crazy that you're doing 256 times as much work as you would do as you were just producing a single number. But the results kind of prove that it was worth doing. So as I mentioned before, there's a computational burden. The training is kind of quick. But every time step, you know what your next training sample should be, so you can do them all simultaneously in parallel. But when you come to actually running this for output, it's extremely slow. And so one second of audio output using DeepMind's resources was, I think, one or two minutes of GPU time. So this is why all of the samples they have are really small, because it took them hours and hours to produce these things. Um, this is clearly impractical. In particular, if I ask my Google Home, um, you know, what is the weather like, it will then have to think for several hours before outputting the, the answer. Anyway, the, they carried forwards. So they, they also had, they kept themselves busy with AlphaGo as well, so you know, they had stuff to do. OK, so now we're with WaveNet 1. Um, now let's talk a bit a little about the, the implementations. Um, there's one in TensorFlow called I, someone IBAB. Most people think this is kind of the reference implementation. Surprisingly, there aren't hundreds of implementations of this. But I guess it's so, t so, so time consuming to train. People are talking about getting sample results after a week on their Titan X, right? So this thing takes a long time to do something which is half OK. DeepMind clearly had a lot of pr processing power to play with this. There's another thing called, there's a project by Google called Magenta, which is really cool. Um, and I can give you a quick aside on this. And they actually have code on GitHub because they've implemented WaveNet for themselves. So this is kind of, from what I see, the most official Google implementation. Um, let me just show you the, so this is, this is the Magenta project. Basically, they've got a whole bunch of interesting, um, like, games to play. Um, they have this kind of, People were doing quick draw. If you haven't seen this, it's super fun to play. This is kind of, you draw a little bit, and then it comes up with more diagrams. Or they play this music, I guess. OK. 
Okay, so this is... This is random Chopin, which they've trained an like a, a LSTM, just like producing the works of Shakespeare by reading the works of Shakespeare. They're doing the same for kind of expressive piano playing. It seems that this is a, this is a place in Google where people have fun. So, um, they also have, they've come up with this N-Synth, which does neural audio synthesis, um, which includes a WaveNet decoder. Um, on the other hand, when you play these samples, uh, prepared to be disappointed compared to the deep mind voices. Um, uh, anyway, it, it, you may find it to be fun. So. And then here's, sorry, the, okay, there we go. Um, so now, now is time to show the, the actual Singapore implementation of this thing. Um, and I have to preface this by saying it doesn't do a very great training of anything. I just wanted to get the code out there in a working state so it'll do something. Um, now the, the, the hotness which I'm doing, so this is kind of, so there's some, at least some TensorFlow takeaway here, is it uses the new dataset API, which I'm sure the Googlers will have witted on about um, in December. And it produces TF records and it streams, streams them from disk. So this is something where the TensorFlow examples actually just read the stuff from memory. It's kind of frustrating, and I see some nodding heads. So. The, the TensorFlow examples in there just have MNIST and read it from memory, and you're like, well, the whole point of this is to read it from disk, because I want to do it asynchronously. Okay. Another thing which is, is this is a Keras model, which I've exported to being an estimator. So this allows you to do the estimator thing, which will then allow you to run this on TPUs or on your mobile or all sorts of other interesting things. Um, and it's in one notebook, which works end to end. Um, and let's just have a look at this. Da, da, da. So I, I don't think I want to execute this, but basically um, the, the flow of this is what I'm, the task I'm trying to do is to take speech, reduce it to its MEL spectrograms, which is a spectrogram like compressed, and then expand it out into good speech again, which is kind of what WaveNet is doing, but I just wanted to have my own little go. And basically I've got some... Um, LibreVox books, which have quite well spoken. I just want to read those in as MP3. Um, so here's some kind of F FFT things. I read them in. This is I read in these samples. Or I do a, an FFT. I then start to write these TensorFlow records out. So this is something which you probably need to download and look at the code if you cared, because it it, it took a while to do this. So. One of, the, one of the other lessons which I do is I actually pre-process everything before I write it to disk. Now, the TensorFlow people seem to want you to pre-process it as it flies off the disk. On the other hand, um, just doing simple processing proved to be such a, a documentation nightmare that it's far easier just to do it in NumPy and save it on disk. So um, perhaps this is easy to do in TensorFlow. There was, there's an example of how I did do it in TensorFlow and then just gave up because manipulating these complex numbers was no fun at all. Um, whereas in NumPy, I can just do it. So basically, I take these spectra and these MEL spectra and then look up, some, make some angles, make some shapes, um, store it into disk with phases that comes in as I can take this data set and I can... parse it. And then I can take the data set and I can shuffle it or batch it or make into an iterator. So, so this, this last bit is, is the magic um, working for me. But it took an awful long time to set up the magic before, the, set up the trick before the magic would work. Um, and it also, I have to say, it also feels very backwards in that you're writing all this code 
and you won't be able to ever run it for two days because you have to run the, write the model and everything else before it will even try and suck the data in. So anyway, that's the experience. Um, so, now I'm gonna, so now I'm set up so I know I have some data which I could read in if I had something which would try and pull the data. So I'm now going to write a Keras model. So I've got two, func two functions here, one of which is a wave net layer, which basically takes, it does two of these 1D convolutions. So this is the, there's a um, tan bit and a sigmoid bit, and it has this dilation rate, which is the skipping. And now it multiplies them together, it pads it out a bit, and then it does this skip out, and here's the residual thing. So, so basically, this is a single node on that TensorFlow graph, in, including the dilation. And then in order to get the actual, for the model, which is the mine MEL spectrograms to the full spectrum, I now just say, OK, I'll take my inputs, and I'll now do, I've got five layers here of WaveNet, and I then kind of make stuff happen. So, so basically, this is the, the WaveNet thing being used um, now, one of the issues that I found is that the Keras internal to TensorFlow is now different from the Keras external to TensorFlow in that the Keras external to TensorFlow works and the one inside TensorFlow doesn't, um, according to the docs. So there are parameters in the ones which the docs don't match what happens in the code. Um, and when Francois Cholet is asked about this, he says, submit a pull request to TensorFlow and closes the issue. Um, this is not, not helpful. Now, the reason I want to use the internal TensorFlow version is because that is the only one which has the, tensor, the Keras to estimate a function. The Keras to estimate a function doesn't work on the external stuff for some mysterious incompatibility reason. Um, anyway, so what, what happens out of this? So Keras is nice. You can build a model, and... Out comes a nice, nice model, which Keras can explain. Keras does all this nice stuff, which is why it's quite nice to use. Um, I can build a custom loss. I can da 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 And then I can set up a training specification and an evaluation specification. And now I can run the mag... So that's setting up the magic trick, and this is the magic. I can now just run train and evaluate, and it will do all the right stuff. So... If you run train and evaluate, because I've got essentially this input function reads this stuff from the data sets, this thing all feeds into itself and trains the model with the right training stuff. And if I look on TensorBoard, it's produced me a beautiful diagram. Um, if I look, OK, we've got some basically some, some graphs of the training performance. All of this stuff is all beautifully done once it connects up. But I can tell you it was not easy. Anyway, so there we have, so, so this thing will produce beautiful graphs um, of thing. I can stop it. I can make predictions. And so, so this is not really a very good demo because it doesn't sound very good. But um, this is the original. But of Pope and Catullus, Lanza, Voltaire, Rousseau and Wilde. That is what Rapin must have had in mind. So... Clearly, this is a, a, a good English speaker speaking some book. This is about bachelors uh, in English in LibriVox. And the text is free because it's Gutenberg Press. And all the speech files are free, like free of any obligation. Or maybe there's a, an attribution here. So. Um, but it's very nicely done. So one, one thing which I do is, is if you then take, I convert that to Mel Spectra. And I then say, well, let's just convert this back into the real spectrum, yes? And then render that to text. And it sounds like, let me just, sorry, let me just make sure that works. Bit of Pope and Catullus, Lanza, Voltaire, Rousseau and Wilde. That is what Rapin must have had in mind when he said that... So this kind of shows that the phase information, so the, the, the complex spectra consists of real magnitudes and a phase number. And so this is why it sounds like it's horribly phasing. It sounds like it's gone through a phaser because it's precise, I've set this, all the phases to exactly zero um, here. So this is, what it, this is how I just use the real part. Oh, sorry, the absolute part. 
Now, I can prove to myself that the actual MEL conversion bit worked OK by using my predictions plus the original phases. Bit of Pope, Cthulhu's, Lambda, Altair, Rousseau, and Wild. So, so this kind of proves that if I could get the phase stuff right, then I'd be in business. Okay. Um, so if I now take out these things, so this is why it's, it's kind of like a non-perfect demonstration. So we get we, finally we've done a bit of prediction. We get to. So it's about fifty-fifty kind of. I would say five out of ten compared on the scale. So. But this is but the. It, it would have been great if it had produced perfect speech. On the other hand, if it had produced perfect speech, that would probably be a product, and I would probably not be open sourcing this straight away. Right? So in, the, in a way, it's good that, it, that the version here doesn't work so well, because it's a perfect example of the Keras and the estimators and everything, um, but it doesn't do exactly what um, we need it to do. So, sorry, sorry about that. OK. So that was the demo. Um, so one of the problems with this one minute equals one second or more is it's not very fast. So people try to speed this up. And one obvious, well, one semi-obvious way to do this is to essentially try and make the layer. A lot of this layer computation as you go along is kind of self-referential. And so there's a thing called fast net wave net which involves queues. And so as, as long as you remember just the right number of things which you pre-calculated, you can calculate this thing a lot faster. And this is several hundred times faster than it used to be, but it's still not fast. Okay. Um, there's a reference to the code and stuff. Uh, that was too fast. So what the next big splash came in October 2017. So basically a year later, well, it's a semi-big splash in that there's a blog post which announced that Google Assistant now uses WaveNet because they've done something really smart. But they didn't really explain what they did. So, so I've, just, just so you know, I've got a Google Home here, which is an English version which doesn't use WaveNet. So, hey Google, can you tell me a limerick? Here's a limerick for you. There was a young lady of Sweden by Edward Lear. There was a young lady of Sweden who went by the slow train to Weedon. When they cried, Weedon Station, she made no observation but thought she should go back to Sweden. OK, so you can hear that it's going up and down. So this is, this is not WaveNet, because this is, whereas the US ones sound much better. So you can hear, you can kind of, now when you hear computer-generated voices, you'll be able to hear what the problems are, right? So I'm sorry to have ruined it for you, but... Um, the WaveNet stuff works really well. And uh, clearly, other people are coming up with good stuff. Um, but yeah, Google Home is not quite there for, for the English version. But what happened afterwards, fortunately, is DeepMind then came up with a November post, which actually explained what they were doing and had a paper, presumably because of some conference release date or something. Um, and the trick there is basically what you want to do is you want to feed in just noise or some kind of audio and make it into the nice speech in one go. If you could do all this in parallel rather than one sample at a time, you'd be done because the GPU will just do layer, 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 and I have 10 seconds of speech. Like I was doing with my, with my example, I was doing 10 second batches, basically. Um, so the question is, how do we make this input straighten out into this beautiful output? So what they do is they have they divide two, they make two synthesizers, one of which is this teacher network, which they've already trained to do what the original one did. And what that does is it takes good samples and converts them into the next sample. So it does the right thing, but also it produces the distribution of every sample along the way as one of its kind of artifacts. What you do with the student one is you put in just noise, and that will then produce at the end a distribution as well as a sample. So you can then put the samples into WaveNet, and then it will come out with a distribution. So that basically you can then say, well, I'd like the two distributions. To be, I can't make the 
the actual samples to be identical, that's too much of a goal. But I can make the distributions of the samples the same. And then basically by converging these two distributions to each other, you force the teacher, can force the student to learn what the distribution should be, which is to be a good wave net. So that they've got this little animation, basically they, they've speeded it up, so instead of 0.2 seconds, they can produce a lot more. So this is, so suddenly it's now a commercially practical um, application. And th they're doing it by having this teacher and student thing. Now the problem with the teacher and student is, if this teacher can be only semi-good after a week on your GPU, it will only train a really pathetic student, right? You, you need to train the teacher all the way before it can train the student. So this is where there are, def I, as far as I know, there are no implementations of this in the wild just because no one else can run it. So this is why I want to play around with the spectra thing. So, yeah. OK, so to wrap up, um, WaveNet started out very good, but it's super expensive. But because it was so good, it proved that it was worth optimizing. And there are a ton of smart people at these companies, in particular DeepMind and Google, um, which have actually done it. And now it's a, vali a viable product, whereas a year ago, it was kind of what, October 2016, it was kind of a, a nice, um, well, nice state-of-the-art result, but it wasn't practical in any way. Um, but there's lots of, one of these things which Google, it seems, is doing with their excessive amounts of hardware is proving that things are possible. But that allows other people to then come along and say, well, actually, now I know it's possible, I can actually train a network to do it, because I know it can be done. Whereas before, academics were training, possibly pushing the envelope upwards, but only me not reaching for the sky, they were reaching just above where they previously were. Whereas coming out with this super good result means that people say, well, you know, I don't want to do the little thing, I should do the big thing. And actually having bigger ideas, there's a huge amount of innovation which is possible in this stuff. So. OK, I've got some ads. We could do this later. We could do this now. Now? OK, so let's do some quick ads. So clearly, you know about the Deep Learning Meetup group because you're here. The next one is the 22nd of February. Um, this, what we typically aim for is talk for people starting out, something from the bleeding edge and lightning talks. Now, it may, may not be that this one has much for beginners, so we will see. Um, but we're, we're trying, at least. Uh, OK, here's a bonus piece of news. Uh, you can now get from Google via Kaggle, which is called Colab now or something, um, free, free 12 hours at a time with a GPU. So basically, you have like a, an IPython notebook, and you can use a GPU for up to 12 hours. And it might throw you off occasionally. But my guess is they're just soaking up all their free GPU time doing this on kind of older GPUs. Um, there's also a nice, there's a blog post there, but free GPU sounds great. Well, it's, yeah. it's great. So can I have a, this okay, show of hands? Can, can everyone raise their hand? Everyone. This is, a, this is just a rejection test. OK, right. Can everyone lower their hand now? Okay. Can everyone who didn't raise their hand before raise it now? Okay. I tried, right? I tried. OK, who wants? kind of more in-depth stuff, like more eager mode, more, OK, OK. These, oh, these are actually the eager people. OK, OK, good, good. Um, who'd like to hear about the text-to-speech race? So this deep, this deep, um, this wavenet thing is part of that, but there's also tachytron and deep voice and loop. And there's all sorts of things, people playing a race for this text-to-speech. Anyone interested in that? Some, OK. Um, what about text speech to text? So this is, I oh, was seeing a lot of the same. OK, some more. OK, OK. okay. Um, who wants to hear more about Google Cloud ML? Ooh, how interesting. OK, thank you. Um, who, wants to un who wants to hear about the latent space tricks which are being played and stuff? OK, OK, OK. Um, well, who, wants to understand, who wants to hear about things which are being done with knowledge bases? Okay, or, or maybe knowledge bases and assistance and that kind of thing. Okay, okay, so we're getting some. Thank you very much. Um, 
Another thing which we're doing, so there wasn't that much, or there may not be that much beginner content today. We're also doing a kind of deep learning back to basics, which will be held at SG Innovate, which is in Carpenter Street near Clark Key. Um, there's one on 6th of Mar March. Um, if you came basically a year ago, it's going to be similar content to the beginner stuff we were doing then. So we're kind of catching up with people who didn't attend the meetup. Um, but also, we're, you know, we're going to be um, hopefully not typical beginner thing, but, and also welcome questions. Um, but you know, we're also conscious that there are quite a few kind of beginner-ish things, and we don't want to duplicate stuff. So um, we're, we're going to play it by ear and find out. So here is the eight-week deep learning developer course, which we talked about a lot last year. And well, this happened from the 25th of September to the 25th of November. And it consisted of twice weekly three-hour sessions, which is a lot, and homework, okay, which had instruction. Everyone had individual projects. Um, people got funded, people with, um, which needed it from Singapore and PRs got funded 70% of the cost by WSG. Um, who here attended the course? Have some? And, and, and that guy did too. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Right. Okay, it was, a, that was held at SG Innovate. This is over. Um, but just to say that when we said it would happen, it did happen, it's over. Okay. There should be another something week deep learning developer course starting sometime soon. It kind of depends on WSG getting their act together. Um, we're not exactly sure how um, super time intensive this should be because it was a real struggle, but maybe that we do a mix of in-person and, and online or, or something or, or leave bigger gaps or something, anyway. Um, and then we'll also probably be doing a deep learning beginner course, um, but this will be slightly more than like an, an AI Saturday or a one day event or an NVIDIA thing. The idea is we'd have a full day of stuff um, to play with real models, we've done this before, but also there'll be kind of a, a list of projects to actually go away and do, with the idea that we'll have kind of like a a point, a midway point where just to ha have people got problems, what's going on, and then kind of a wrap-up session. So the idea is we have some kind of one-on-one -on -one thing, but also re regroup. So this would be kind of a what we found from the deep learning developer course is actually doing a project is hugely more than just sitting there or, or reading a Udacity thing. Having your own project or something you can actually do forces the learning a lot more. So there's a link at the bottom. We'll post the link in the thing. So that's me. Okay. So, okay. I'll take questions now and we'll switch over.